I want to end here by taking some time to kind of put all this together and discuss all of these ideas and in, in all these types of reactions in one video. So overall with aqueous reactions, we want to be able to predict products for precipitation and acid base reactions. That's our double displacement pattern. For oxidation reduction, we're just going to identify what's going on in a reaction. What's oxidized, what's reduced, what are my agents? In general, we want to be able to write net ionic equations. We can still do that for oxidation reduction, right? We're separating out things that are soluble, moving, uh, canceling out spectators. We want to be able to characterize what's going on in the different types of reactions. Swapping ions, transferring protons, transferring electrons, um, what's going on. And really the purpose is to identify the type of a given reaction. Is this an oxidation reduction reaction? Is this precipitation? What are we looking at there? So when we're looking to figure out what's going on, there's patterns here. So for precipitation reactions, we can see things that we'd want to be on the lookout for. One, we always make a solid. We make the precipitate. In a precipitation reaction, you make a precipitate. The other thing that in precipitation reactions, the same ions are present on both sides, right? You have, it's all about just swapping partners. And the only thing that changes is that ions swap partners. When we're looking at the net ionic equation, our characteristic that we'd be expecting is cation plus anion makes a solid. You can get some kind of variations, you can get fancy, but generally it's going to be cation plus anion makes a solid. That is the basis of precipitation. Acid-base reactions, you're now looking for the H in the acid and the OH in the base. You still use that same double displacement patterns, but you still have, you now are just making water and an ionic compound instead of two ionic compounds. Um, it's important to note, water is always a product. And in the net ionic equation, you're generally looking at H plus plus OH minus gives you water. You can have some differences if there's an insoluble salt involved, either as your base can be an insoluble salt, or um, if you are making a, uh, if you make an insoluble salt, uh, or weak acids can also affect this. You're gonna have weak acids that show up in here, but um, otherwise, for your reaction, it's you're almost always gonna be making water um, and then something else kind of, and then you know other kind of flavorings, but always eat, always making water. Oxidation reduction reactions, really if we want to know if something is an oxidation reduction, we would need to assign oxidation numbers. That is really going to always be the way that we could identify it. Um, but we can also use like, um, there could be different ions. What we really can also tell is if there's different ions present on each side of the reaction, um, that would be an indication. So for example, in this net ionic, you can see that sulfite, SO3 2 minus, becomes SO4 2 minus that is indicative of um, a change in ion. In all of our previous examples, we're looking at ions just swapping places or becoming insoluble or something in, in, into an insoluble compound. This, the actual ions have changed. If the ions change, that means you're dealing with an oxidation reduction. Um, a couple other things to note, combustion is always oxidation reduction and single replacement reactions are always oxidation reduction. So those two, those pattern, that pattern, single replacement, and then combustion, those are always oxidation reduction reactions um, that aren't always necessarily aqueous. One of the things, redox happens outside of aqueous chemistry um, in gas and in solids, other things. Um, it's more general than this. So what we also want to be able to do is predict products. When given reactants, can you predict the products without doing the reaction? Again, not for redox quite yet. Come back for Gen Chem 2, Chapter 17. But the idea here is if they follow a double displacement, you can use that double displacement pattern. Swap ions, swipe the H+, right? Is it an acid base? Figure it out and then just check your products. If it's insoluble, it turns into a solid phase. If it's water, it gets a liquid. Um, those ideas. Balancing, also very important in this. Um, but we want to be able to predict products. So let's look at some examples. We want to predict the products with two reactions. I have lead to chlorate plus lithium bromide makes what? Um, and then potassium phosphate plus nitric acid makes what? So we want a chemical equation and we know it's always gonna be like, what are the reactants, what are the products? We're given the reactants here. So it's gonna be a question of what type of reaction is it? 
Are they all ionic compounds? Is there an acid? If you're predicting products, it has to follow a double displacement. It's just a question of what is involved. So do your double displacement and swap partners. Then check your products. Is it insoluble? Um, what's going on with that? So let's predict some products. So PB, ClO32 plus LiBr. These are both ionic comps. PB lead is a metal, Li lithium also a metal. Whenever we are faced with two ionic compounds, we're going to do our double displacement. So if we want to predict those products, we know that what we're doing is going to be, so I have the PB, chlorate, ClO3 minus, polyatomic because it's in those parentheses. If we look it up, it has a charge of negative one. I have two of them, so that's negative two. The so lead is lead two. Bromide is a halogen, 7A. That's a minus one. Lithium is Li plus. It is an alkali metal, always plus. Chlorate, polyatomic, popular one here. I wasn't very creative, I see, in coming up with examples. Um, and so if we want to take a look, we know we're just going to form, use our crossover method. Figure out what's going on. And so the PB is going to become PBBr2. And the LiClO3 is just LiClO3 lithium chloride, because they're plus or minus one. So we can write those as our products, PBBr2, leave some space, LiClO3. One of the things to note, um, the order you write these doesn't matter. Um, as long as they're on the product side, that matters. But the order of which one goes first does not matter. So um, we've gotten our products. So that's step one, using our ionic, forming ionic compounds. Now we want to assign phases, ionic solubility rules. So group 1A, so let's do PBBR. That's lead. Lead is not in group 1A. It's not ammonium. Bromide is not nitrate, acetate chlorate or perchlorate. Silver, lead, and mercury compounds are insoluble. That thing is a solid because of the lead. So let me get that out there. This thing is insoluble. And that is what rule is that three? So it's a solid. Um, lithium chlorate is a bit easier. Rule one: lithium soluble. Lithium is an alkali metal, so that is soluble. Oh, okay. I do need to write AQ then. Final thing I need to do is balance it. I need a two right there, a two right there. So the overall reaction would be PB, ClO32 aqueous plus two LiBr aqueous becomes PB Br2 solid plus two LiClO3 aqueous. We have completely predicted this reaction, what products we would make, what phases they would be in without doing it. We did not have to do any actual chemistry. That is actually the purpose of being a chemist. Uh, that is, uh, you want to be able to predict chemical reactions, predict what will happen without having to do it. You know, if you had a solution of two chloride, um, you probably shouldn't do anything with lithium bromide that you add into that mixture because you're going to make a solid. Conversely, lead is very bad for you. So if you are trying to remove lead from a solution, say you have a solution of lead to chlorate, you're using it for something, and you want to get the lead out of the water, right, to clean it, um, lithium bromide would be a worthwhile thing to add in because instead of being dissolved in solution, say where someone could drink, um, it's now stuck in a solid, which you can more easily filter out. So, you know, these sorts of ideas, being able to make this prediction, either if you want to keep the lead dissolved, don't add this, or if you want to make the lead 
precipitate out, go ahead and add that lithium bromide. Okay. K3PO4HNO3. So on face, this one looks a little more complicated because HNO3, that's what we've called an acid. K3PO4, that's ionic. Really still, the main process is going to be double displacement. Really, the only reaction pattern that we really have available to us is going to be double displacement. Once you recognize that this is an acid, that HNO3 is an acid, it's going to follow the exact same pattern. It's going to do the same idea. And so we know that this HNO3 is really H plus and NO3 minus. So our ions, uh, we have K plus and NO3 minus. And then, whoops, I'm going to use purple there, be consistent. H plus and PO4, three minus, same idea. So do my crossover. One and one there, one and three on that one. So this becomes KNO3, and this becomes H3PO4. So those are the products that we make. Oh, I guess I kind of jumped the gun on that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, KNO3 is soluble because of that K plus and because of the nitrate. So you call it rule one, but rule two also works. But the potassium nitrate is extremely soluble. So soluble as it stands. So then um, H3PO4. So H3PO4, this is a side rule. Uh, off of our ionic compounds that we just want to learn that this thing is an acid and that makes it soluble. Acids are soluble in water. Now note, when it's an acid, just because it's soluble does not mean that it separates out. H3PO4 is not a strong acid. If you were separating it into ions, it won't separate out, um, but it is going to be soluble in water. All acids are soluble in water. It just would not separate for the purpose of like creating a net ionic. So you keep it as H3PO4. But it is soluble in water, so it doesn't get the AQ. So got that. Final step is going to be to balance. We need a three there and a three. So overall, I get three PO4 aqueous plus three H N O three aqueous becomes. 3KNO3 aqueous plus H3PO4 aqueous. Again, we can make predictions about what's going on, what you want to do in your reaction, um, what you're going to make, what you're going to produce, all sorts of things. Um, and you can make these predictions without doing the experiment. You can also, all these have come from doing experiments, it's important to know. That. Experiments underlie all these ideas, but you can start to understand and make predictions. And one of the things really put all of this together into a comprehensive uh, understanding of chemical reactivity. All right, so that'll do it for uh, reactions, aqueous reactions, nice big. Uh, part of chapter four. We'll move on to the final bit here, stoichiometry. We've got two videos about that for this set where we're looking for questions for participation 224. See you there.